Uh, my name is Martha Lotz. I'm 92 years young, and I live at Claremont Park, which is a uh, retirement community with all levels. And I'm very fortunate to be able to live there because everyone cares, uh, whether you're another resident or a staff, or as we call them, a team member, they're wonderful. And I'm Mariah Bernhardt, and I've been in the aging field for about 11 years now. Um, my background is actually in therapy and art therapy. And before I started working with older adults, I actually worked with at-risk youth in Chicago. So it was a really big transition. I uh, have worked with Martha, thankfully, for the last six years, and she has really helped me change my perception about aging. A couple of those things that we did together is we went scuba diving in the Denver Aquarium downtown. Um, Martha was, I believe, 90, 90. and I was not. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Martha also went skydiving for her 90th birthday and 90 first, first birthday. Um, and if we have time, we'll even share a little clip with you guys. But these are the wonderful interactions that I've had a privilege to have with Martha and many other residents at Claremont Park. Now, my role at Claremont Park is quality of life. Um, I direct the quality of life programs there, wellness, fitness. Um, we do a lot of education and training about also changing the culture of aging. And so that's kind of my background, too. So thank you for inviting us. Um, and this is our third time here, and it's always a pleasure meeting everybody. So I usually like to ask, um, my first question is, what is old for you guys? Give, it, give me a number. 70. 70? 80. 80? About mm -hmm. 70, 80? OK. Any, yeah, 85? 40? <laughs> oh, I'm just <laughs> As we approach that number, right? Um, or, or pass it. Um, and what do you think the role of older people in our society is? Yeah. To teach us their life lessons and to help guide us. Absolutely. Any other answers? Guidance. Uh, leave a legacy, teach us the history, right? Um, what do we see usually in society when we view old people? Yes? Um, a lot of times they're being like, pushed out of jobs mm -hmm. um, because they're hiring someone that's fresh out of college they can pay like significantly less for their position. Absolutely. And instead of like teaching them the new programs or implementing and so they just push them out and why not? Yes. There are some biases against old people, right? And so one of them, for instance, based on what you're saying, is you can't learn new things. We'd rather, we'd rather hire younger folks that already have that knowledge rather than teach it, right? What are some other biases that we're aware of? I think kind of like your life is over after a certain point. Right. So there's what you can't contribute anything else to society. You just kind of sit on your rocking chair. Right. And just. That's it, you're done. How many of you guys have beauty products? <laughs> Almost everybody here, right? And what's the messaging that we get with those beauty products when we look at commercials and things like that? Try to look younger. We're, we're a very heavily based society that, that emphasizes youth as positive, right? And wrinkles as not so much. Right? So that kind of helps me to plunge into this whole idea of ageism and ableism. And Martha's going to share some of her experiences as well because she's experienced that firsthand. Um, anybody ever come across these terms? Yes? Um, when we talk about how our elders are perceived in our society, and I say elders, um, instead of elderly, if you notice, right? Anybody know why? Yes? No? I just saw you move. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, a, a 
appreciate one one um, makes you think of more respect than the other. So elders, if you have probably watched movies and read books, um, throughout our society up until about 200 years ago, there was, the elder was the head of the family, right? The head of society. They're the ones that passed on the knowledge and the stories. Um, in our society today, when people use the term elderly, what does that evoke? What, what comes to your mind? Frail. Frail? Needy. Yeah, more like a condition and not a noun. Like elder is a noun. Mm -hmm. Elderly is a verb, adverb. Right. Um, that suggests that somebody's just not what they used to be. Right. So I'll, I'll pause here and I will encourage all of you guys to really look at language and to start shifting that. Uh, part of social work is social justice and changing the trends of society, right? Um, and you can, language is very powerful. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit too later. But a lot of people when they think elderly, this is what comes to mind. Irrelevant, cantankerous, right? Crippled, um, dependent. And that's, a, that's a, a general view of getting old in Western society. We even see that in many of our commercials and magazines, right? So can anybody read that aloud? The old bag you'll actually love. That's pretty direct, right? So instead of wrinkles and sagginess, something new in luggage, okay? How about this one? This is in actual magazines. So that's why we wanted to show it. Because I think sometimes we just flip over and we're just so used to that stuff. So one is about Olay beauty products, right? All about youth and how amazing this will make you look. And the other one is about, again, see under normal lights and see under light quest lights. So normal lights, you look old. This other light, you look amazing and, and young. Has anybody here ever bought a card that kind of makes fun of somebody's age? I have, right? Yeah. And there's still a, lot out, still a lot out there. But that's, again, another subliminal message that our society sends to everybody to say, you're over the top. You've reached a certain age, and you're irrelevant. You don't matter anymore. OK? So next time when you buy one of those cards, think that. <laughs> Um, and, you know, again, be nice to old people. One day they may save your life, and then there's a bear running after somebody in a wheelchair, right? So ageism, this is an actual a direct definition of ageism. So this time I do need somebody to read it aloud because I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I'm looking at you because you're the closest. <laughs> Prejudice against our fear future self. Stereotyping and discriminating against individuals or groups on the basis of their age. So, what do you think about this whole idea of ageism? It does exist. In fact, it's one of the, the last ism in our society that most people don't fight against. Did you know that? So here's the thing. Remember we talked about birthday cards, about you know making fun of age and all that. So imagine if you got a card that said, ha, 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 something about you being Jewish, or ha, 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 something about you being short, or a woman, or an African American. That's not acceptable in our society. Ageism is still. So that's how prevalent that is in American culture, and not just American, mostly Western culture. Covert ageism. This is the things that we actually do every day that trickle into our language and the way that we interact with other people that we don't even notice. But it is ageism. It's part of ageism. And one of it is, and it, I think it comes from a really good place, when we say to somebody, you don't look 80, you look great. How many of, you, of us have done that? I've done that. 
right? And we come with the best intention, but what does that really mean when we say that? You should look worse, you should look worse. Yeah. right? That's what we're saying. What's another example? My mother is 82 and she still drives a car. How many of us have said that? We say it all the time. And what does that imply? She's 82, she can't drive it. She shouldn't be driving a car, right? In some cases, that's true. There are people who shouldn't be driving a car. And whether they're 82 or 38, right? But that's what that word still implies, that they should not or, sh or usually cannot do that. I love old folks. They're all so nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Is> that true? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but also, what is that coming from? Generalization. It's generalization. There are some folks that are not so nice and sweet. That's true. But it's uh, anybody familiar with the term paternalistic? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Say that again? I said it's kind of condescending. Condescending, yeah. Like, you know, we know better. We can just, you know, we should decide for you. You can't make decisions for yourself in condescending. Absolutely. And then, of course, and this you see actually a lot in my field still, and that's a, that's a problem that we're working on. And that these are the terms sweetie, honey, dear, cute. Again, very paternalistic. So I tell people when I see them talking to older adults that way, I don't like to be taught that way. So don't even think about talking to older adults. These are the elders of our society. They're not sweetie, honey, baby, whatever, okay? Um, so I wanna pause here and I wanna ask Martha to share her story. She had a recent experience in a hospital actually with her, her experience with ageism. Yes. Um. I had a fading spell, was taken to the hospital, and in ER, all these nurses and doctors, professionals, said, you don't look 92. And I said, what does 92 look like? And I didn't get an answer. Interesting. What's interesting, if you look at research, how many of you guys like to do some research? Not many, huh? <laughs> Looks like my class when I went to school. <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting. If you look at social research, um, there are a lot of things that are coming up. First of all, they predict that um, the millennial generation, the average lifespan will be between 100 and 120. Did you know that? How many of you are millennials? Yeah. So. What will old age look like then? It's going to be a little different, right? Another thing about ageism, when do you think people are most happy in their life? What's the, the decade that people say they're the happiest? 40s. 40s, you say? Sure. OK. Children. 60s, I hear. 60s, 70s. Nobody said 20s? No. <laughs> or teens? <laughs> Anybody? Once you retire, which by the way, again, millennials, it's going to be a little after 65, a little later than that, right? Um, actually, it's in the 80s. Um, and the people who said they are most dissatisfied with their life were between four, in their 40s and 50s. Interesting, huh? So there's something actually really amazing to look forward to where people actually look at their life and come to a place of joy and happiness. And it doesn't mean that there aren't challenges at that decade of 80s to 90s, but there is something that grounds people and um, the priorities change. Uh, working with elders, and I work with elders that are in different levels of living, we call it. We, I work with elders that are e extremely active, like Martha, 
Um, and I work with elders that are living with progressed dementia and Alzheimer's. And I also work with elders that are very um, challenged physically, which means that they depend on other people for full support to live, okay? And the one thing that really comes up again and again is the sense of resilience. You guys studied resilience a little bit? What is this whole idea? What's this whole idea of resilience? Yeah. It's facing a problem with the mindset of how do I overcome it? Yeah. Who can help me or what can I bring out of myself? Yes, finding your resources. It's really about attitude, right? Coming to a challenge and saying, ugh, I just can't do it. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to overcome this. That's resilience. Throughout all of our research with these different people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, one amazing thing came up. And that is, and I think it has to do with this whole idea of when you get to your 80s and 90s, you're the happiest. And one of the things that they came up with um, during our research is that this whole sense of worrying about what people think about me, um, worrying about what's going to happen in the world, worrying about how I'm going to be part of this group, fizzles away. What do you think their focus is on? Just living. Living. Hanging out. Yeah, you got it. The moment. Yes, yeah. in the moment. <laughs> being present in the moment. And they'll say, yeah, sure, I care about my grandkids or I care about my family, but I'm not going to distract worrying about the elections or about you know something that's happening in Russia or this or even in my family from the quality of life that I want. So yeah, it's about living, okay? So that's an interesting part of aging, not ageism, but aging in our society. There is a very positive outcome to it, okay? The next thing I wanna to go to, because we wanted, Michael, we wanted to leave a little bit more time for questions. We usually just like finish like 30 seconds before the class ends. So the next thing I wanna talk about is this whole idea of ableism, which to me actually being in this field is even more detrimental than ageism. Okay, after being in this field for 11 years, um, I find this to be the hardest thing. Um, and ableism is not just with older adults. Neither is ageism, by the way. Have you ever had an older adult that went to a kid and said, what do you know? You're just a kid. That's also ageism, by the way. All of you guys that are gonna start your work after finishing school here, you're probably gonna encounter some ageism by the sheer fact that you're young. And there are people who are older in this field and they're gonna sometimes say, what does this kid know? So prepare yourself with something to respond to these people and also prepare yourself to be open and learn from older people, All right? Okay, I'm bouncing back and forth, but ableism, Anybody else read this aloud? Can I get another person? You already did your, your job. <laughs> it's like Emily's next there. I know, right? <laughs> Prejudice or discrimination against someone living with a physical or cognitive challenge or disability. Okay. This is, I think, maybe even more relevant to whatever you choose to do after this. How many of you guys are um, wanting to work with older adults after you graduate? Great. One, two, three, four, maybe, five, six, maybe. That's awesome. Um, by the way, guys, in 2025, uh, at least a third of Colorado's population is gonna be 65 or older. So your roles are gonna be even more vital in this field, this whole field of aging. And aging successfully is what we call it. Okay, so think about that. But for those who choose to go in other directions, this is very applicable as well. Because ableism is not about older adults only. What is it about too? When do we apply ableism? Prejudice and discrimination against someone living with a physical or cognitive challenge or ability. Anybody? Where do you see this? So the question is, where would you see ableism? Everywhere. 
everywhere. Anybody here have any kids? Okay. Um, when you take your kids to school and there are people with different abilities, what are some, some of the challenges that you may see there? I'm talking about kids. I know in my classroom growing up, um, there was a girl in a wheelchair and she had a really hard time participating mm -hmm. in things. So um, even just the classrooms weren't set up to accommodate yes. um, other abilities and other yeah. modes of transportation. So right. Just logistical things around that. Yeah. Um, this is a big thing with ADA. Um, and the disability community, right? And a lot of them will say, I don't have a disability. I live with different abilities, okay? And we try to really encourage that mind uh, process in also um, older adult communities that we can't look at dementia and people using wheelchairs for mobility as a disabili disability. This is where they are, okay? Um, our role is to support them to live life to the fullest and um, guide them in a, a life of successful aging. That's kind of where we, we come from. Um, but ableism is very pervasive everywhere. So I can tell you a little bit about this in older adults communities. Claremont Park six years ago was separated by the level of care, okay? Um, six years ago, we had a nursing home, an assisted living, and an independent living, and they did not mix much, okay? In fact, Martha, you can tell them a little bit about what it was before. Uh, 22 years ago, I first came to Claremont Park, and uh, at that time, just before I arrived, you were not allowed to go to the dining room if you were in a wheelchair or in an electric wheelchair, either one of them, um, and uh, you weren't even allowed to go in with a walker. That changed just before I arrived there, but there was still some hostility among those who did not need uh, an equip a piece of equipment, uh, and, and finally that was overcome but uh, they wouldn't even go over to the, what we called then the nursing home, where the boutique was, because they didn't want to be around people who were ill, physically or mentally. They did not want to see them, so they wouldn't go over. And it was mostly because of fear. They were afraid that that's the way where they would end up, and they did not want to end up that way. So they would just stay away as long as they could. Uh, they still had excellent care at that time, but it was just still a, not an inclusive society as it is now. Thank you. So Martha actually was there when this whole discriminatory and prejudice um, environment was happening. This was before my time. But um, there was before a, you were born. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll, no, no. Um, there was a significant change six years ago at Claremont Park. Um, we decided to ch to change our culture completely, um, and one of the pieces of the cultures that we changed was saying enough of this division between levels of care. Um, we're going to be an inclusive community, um, and that really helped us. Um, in a completely different path in our journey. Um, before that happened, people in our independent living um, neighborhood would call the people in the nursing home, they would say that's the dying center, okay? They expected that that's pe where people are going to die. Now, if you know a little bit about care centers today, you will know that many, many people are actually younger adults living in care centers. So imagine if somebody would call a place where you now call home a dying center, okay, and you're 38 or you're 45 living with MS. It's a little different, right? Um, ableism is really hard to change 
We still have some people that come up with different comments when they see, and it does come from fear, like Martha said, what if this happens to me, right? And sometimes when fear comes out, we say some things that are not very kind to other people around us. In Claremont Park, um, one of the things that we look at, and again, we like to do some research to back this up, but one of the things that we look at um, through our, we actually call, we have a, uh, what we call Masterpiece Lifestyle Review, and it's all about 70 questions and evaluation. It's a self-assessment. Um, and one of the things that they focus on is your self-esteem esteem and self-image. And what happens, do you think, to older adults when you keep telling them they can't, they can't, they'll fall, they'll fall, they'll get sick, they'll get sick? What do you think happens to the self-esteem? They doubt themselves. Yes. So it, it really it brings down people's self-esteem, right? Not only that, but the wider research that people have done is when people have that attitude and they take it in, 30% increase in negative things that happen in their life. It literally causes people to get sick more, fall more. All of these things that they fear will happen and that people tell them that will happen, happen 30% more, okay? So again, somebody here brought up this whole idea of attitude, right? So maintaining a positive attitude of aging is really important. It also is one of the ways to bring, to, to bring down ableism. Another thing is um, memory loss. Wow. That research was really mind-blowing because, again, when you tell people and make fun of loss of memory as you get older, which by the way, memory loss, um, and especially dementia, is not a given when you get older. That's not a natural occurring phenomenon of aging. Did you know that? So when you start making fun in society about people losing their memory, guess what happens? What happens? Yes, thank you. So there's an increase of that, specifically. Um, another thing is longevity. Um, did you know that people that have a negative attitude about aging, you should learn this now so you can start changing this, <laughs> um, actually live um, between seven and a half to eight years less than those who have a positive attitude about aging. Pretty amazing if you want to live longer, right? <laughs> so one of the things that we do at Claremont Park that we do want to share with you um, is we have two wellness initiatives, and you guys might want to look into this online. They have a website. One of them is called Masterpiece Living. Let's see if I have it here. Yeah. Masterpiece Living, and that is specifically to create a culture of wellness not only in aging communities and retirement or senior communities but actually starting now and what the research shows all across the board is aging starts when you're born right yes it you're always going forward in time <laughs> And to create a positive um, future for yourself as you age, you need to start early. And there are four different components of wellness that we look at as human beings. Anybody care to you know, throw out what those are? What do you think those components are? Components of wellness. Physical? Yes. Emotional. Yes. Physical. We call it emotional spiritual. Yep. What else? Cognitive. Cognitive, intellectual, very good. And? Interpersonal. Interpersonal, social. Okay? So those are the four components of wellness that we really focus on and that we urge everybody, no matter what their age is, to develop and hone those, okay? Um, if you are lonely and live most of your life in loneliness, that's gonna affect all other components in your life. That's gonna affect how you grow older, okay? People who are lonely tend to be more sick and they tend to um, also not live as long, all right? 
Um, the other initiative that Claremont Park actually started with is called the Eden Alternative. It's been around for, for quite a while, and I would suggest that you start with that research, okay? Um, the Eden Alternative is actually a complete culture change initiative. It doesn't just talk about changing lifestyle. It talks about changing the whole concept of aging and care services. Um, and so I encourage you guys to look at that. What we have found through our study of Masterpiece Living, like I told you guys, is that, you know, have any of you heard like once you reach 30, it's all downhill? Some doctors still say that, by the way. <laughs> um, we have found that when you, um, you do live, 30 is the optimal age of physical health and intellectual health and all of that. But instead of going downhill, um, when you um, remain healthy in all those four components, you actually continue to grow and become very well in your life up until your 80s, 90s, however old you're going to be. You see this little dip over, over here? That dip relates to something that happens probably to every person in the world, and that is when there is a, um, a crisis or a huge challenge happening in your life, whether it's a car crash that leaves you in a really challenging position, whether it's you being diagnosed with cancer, wh whatever challenge it is. Now, most people in older adulthood with this challenge, if they don't have a significant wellness and lifestyle that promotes positive aging, they'll go this way. All right. When you do have a very um, positive attitude and outlook and a program to, to help you keep your wellness, you bounce back. That's called a resilient curve. Okay. So it's all about the resilience to help you bounce back and live longer. And the idea is live long and well and die short. <laughs> That's the whole idea of our wellness campaign at Claremont Park. What do you think about that? Does that make sense? So, yeah. So, so Martha, those four areas that Mariah talked about, the social, um, the social, social spiritual, social, physical, and intellectual. You know them all already. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can't remember, Martha, remember them all. But which, which, is, which is most important for you to focus on? Um, they're all important. Um, I like to be social, and, and I have a spiritual life. And uh, the, we have a Claremont College, which we have courses for our intellectual well-being. And, uh, uh, and the physical, when I can, I will do my physical. I can't always do that. But I try, and I get very upset when I can. <laughs> because they're all important for the well-being of an individual and the growth of an individual. And we can still learn even though we are in our 90s and we have people in their hundreds there that are still learning. There's no reason why we can't learn something, something new every day, even if it's just a quote or a, anything, which is very important. And I, I keep very busy. <clears throat> I don't just sit around. I'm very involved in volunteer work. <clears throat> I, I am the treasurer of the Capitol Hill United Ministry, which operates the Women's Homelessness Initiative, where we have uh, at 20 to 25 women every night that are homeless spending in a church in most of the Capitol Hill uh, area and this is a very important thing to me and also in my church involvement I am the work of session I still take the minutes and transcribe them I still do the directory I send out notices of what is happening I may be 92 but I'm not dead <laughs> and I don't know when I'm going to die it could be tomorrow it could be 10 years but I have to keep going it's important. 
and we're done. <laughs> that's, our, that's the whole message. And I'd like to tell you about the Eden yes. alternative. They, we have courses there for the Eden alternative. And not only the, the team members go, but residents are invited. And it changes you. It is amazing. It's a three-day class, which is very tiring but a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, a lot of learning, and it really changes you. It, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mariah, can you say something about just um, how Claremont brought in a social worker to kind of head up the sure. living piece of Absolutely. that? Sure, absolutely. Kind of brought social worker to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Actually, we have a gentleman that graduated from this um, social work school here at DU. Um, Andrew Stewart is our Masterpiece Lifestyle Coordinator at Claremont Park. It's a very different position from a typical, what you call typical, I guess, um, social work in the field of aging, first of all, but also in the field of social work. Yeah. Um, so imagine if your focus is on really changing the well-being of people and having direct effect on that um, when it comes to creating programs and projects focused on healthy living. All right. That's what Andrew um, does. And not, not only that, but Andrew also is um, constantly researching and doing um, different, um, creating different partnership partnerships like DU um, to further our messaging of what successful aging is all about. So again, for all three of you, I think that raised your hand when I said who's interested in working with older adults, there's a lot and there are going to be more positions that I think um, will evolve uh, for social workers out there. Um, and it may not be just uh, focused on typical therapy or, or casework or all of that, but really changing um, a whole perspective of aging out there. 